Okay, don't forget, now when I give you a word of command, on guard, the first thing you need to do is scream the word of command, on guard, back, and adopt your natural fighting stance. And there were no cecils, no puffs. I want the enemy fright to death before you even get there. So listen in then, on guard! On guard! On guard! The bayonet. For three centuries, this crude and primitive weapon has endured as the infantry soldier's most indispensable tool. It's a very basic weapon. There's nothing to it. It is a blade with a handle that fits onto your rifle. And it is very much a symbol of what you're doing. The bayonet is a very nasty instrument of war. I mean, this is a Baker rifle bayonet. It is an exceedingly nasty thing. And the thought of that being sort of inserted into your belly and twisted around is, is enough to spoil your day. We're in a situation when looking at a bayonet where you're dealing with a weapon that does nothing, does nothing at all. A rifle fires, grenades blow up. This thing does nothing. It's totally reliant upon its user to close with the enemy and look him in the whites of his eyes and use it. The bayonet takes its name from Bayonne in the south of France, where it was supposedly invented in the 1640s. From Manchuria to the Falklands, soldiers have been fixing bayonets ever since. Nowhere more enthusiastically than in the British Army. This most basic weapon has remained virtually unchanged. A long steel blade attached to the end of a rifle or musket, turning the soldier's firearm into a lethal stabbing weapon. Well, the earliest bayonet is, is, is this kind of thing, which is the, the, the plug bayonet. And quite simply, it's uh, shoved in the end in the barrel of the, of the weapon. Essentially, prior to the existence of the bayonet, uh, soldiers were either equipped with a musket or a pike, which was essentially a 16-foot-long spear. These kind of weapons weren't that accurate, and so you couldn't rely on the firepower to keep the enemy, particularly enemy cavalry, at bay. So you needed something else to defend the soldiers while they were reloading. The pikes did the job for quite a long time, but the problem with the pikeman was that's all he could do. So there was always a, a search for something which would enable the, the musketeer to combine his firepower and some kind of defensive ability. Now, the crucial point about the bayonet is that it enables you with the same soldier to combine both those, those infantry weapons. What therefore happens is you have the infantry able to stand up against cavalry, you have infantry with firepower much, much greater because every infantry soldier is now carrying a weapon that is simultaneously an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon. Fire. A weapon with which you can fire a shot and a weapon with which you can stab, slash and defend yourself. Your the British Army began using the bayonet at a time when the major threat came from the Jacobite rebels in the Scottish Highlands. This was no orthodox enemy. They didn't fight with disciplined lines of muskets and cannon. Instead, they relied on the dreaded Highland Charge. Basically, a Highland Charge works on momentum. The men come thundering towards the enemy ranks. Now, when they get very close, within 20 or 30 paces, bang, they fire a volley from their firearms. The next thing, it's out with a broadsword, they drop the firearms, and the front rank men, who are very well armed, they have their broadswords, they sort of break through and the men who are less well armed are behind them, so once they shatter the line, your guys who just have the scythe or something they've picked up off the farm, I mean, there's such chaos in the enemy ranks that it's their chance to get stuck in. Although regarded as primitive and savage, the Highlander was more than a match for a redcoat soldier, even one armed with a bayonet. Well, the Highland charge probably dates back to the beginning of the 17th century. The clansmen would rush forward, first of all pushing their opponent off with their targe, they would stab him in the arm with their dirk, and finally slashing down with their sword. The only other documented technique was a simple move that you used to catch the bayonet drills of the soldiers. They would run up towards the ranks of the redcoat troops getting just in front of them, they would drop down onto one knee. Then at a given moment they would lunge forward, lifting the bayonet from the front of the soldier's gun, they would cut towards his body or legs. But it meant the Highlanders were going to go through the, the raw levies of the government like a dose of salt. So they were going to carve them into pieces. And uh, men who are not very battle trained, when they see a bunch of Highlanders bearing down on them, they're not going to stand around, you know. They are going to be off ski. This is exactly what happened at the Battle of Killiecrankie in 1689. The government troops discovered, to their cost, that their plug bayonets were fatally flawed. The main problem with the plug bayonet, of course, is that having shoved it into the barrel of the musket, 
you can't actually fire the weapon. The British Army came badly unstuck at the Battle of Killy Cranky in 1689 because of this, where some of the troops fitted their plug bayonets, some didn't. Some then unfitted them, others fitted them, and the British Army was swept away by a Highland charge. So something better than this had to, to be developed. And the answer was found with this bayonet, which was the uh, socket bayonet. Now, the thing about this is that the bayonet is now diverted away from the barrel, which means that the soldiers can fire while the bayonet is fixed. Obviously, this is quite an intimidating weapon, but it's only as good as the troops that are actually holding it. In the hands of experienced troops, it could be rather devastating and extremely intimidating. But if the troops that are trying to use it are nervous or poorly trained or don't have much self-confidence, it's really worse than useless. And so it proved. The socket bayonet alone was not enough to guarantee victory. And for 50 years, the Highland Charge held sway over the British Army. In 1745, another stunning victory for the Highlanders at the Battle of Preston Pans marked the beginning of the most serious rebellion yet, led this time by Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie. The Duke of Cumberland, the King's youngest son, led 10,000 men north to stop him. But his army too was to discover the power of the Highland Charge at Clifton. The same happened at Falkirk. Cumberland was desperate for a winning strategy. He spent the winter of 1745 devising one. Cumberland realised that it wasn't going to be an easy victory for him. He had to think of a way to put down these clansmen. He began to think of ways of using the bayonet, which was uh, well issued in the British Army at this time. And he began to drill his men in Aberdeen, where he'd now positioned his forces. And day after day, they practised this bayonet drill of going off to the right. And he hoped that this would be the way he would Push finally break bayonet. the Highland Charge. Ah! By this method, each soldier would not bayonet the clansmen attacking him directly, but the one bearing down on his neighbour. At the same time, he had to rely on the man to his left to do the same for him. It was a bold, apparently suicidal plan, which needed iron nerve and strict discipline to succeed. To strike to the side with the bayonet achieves a number of uh, functions. First of all, the Highlanders attacking you are expecting to be attacked or to have the bayonet aimed to them from the front, and they can protect themselves against that with their shield, and if they can catch and deflect the bayonet with their shield, they push, as it were, the musket to one side, and they're protected not only against the bayonet, but also against the musket itself. However, if you attack somebody to the side, they don't have the benefit of their shield. Instead, particularly if their sword arm is raised, they have an undefended side in which you can stab them, so that a line of men, each of whom, because they are operating in a disciplined fashion, can feel confident that the man next to them is covering them, can then actually turn their weapon to against the undefended side of the person who is attacking their neighbour. Cumberland's army was ready to take on the rebels one final time. The two armies met on Culloden Moor on April the 16th, 1746. The battle began with a barrage of withering fire from government guns, but still the Jacobites managed to mount one of their ferocious charges. Cumberland was about to have his bayonet drill brutally tested. In the battle itself, the attacking Jacobites actually reached the British line, and at that point the bayonet was decisive. It was decisive because it enabled the British musketeers to put up a hand-to-hand -hand fight against their assailants and a hand-to-hand -hand fight in which they had an effective weapon and an effective drill, and they both worked. And as a result, in a lot of the subsequent newspaper reports and correspondence by people who'd taken part in the battle, they emphasised the bayonet. They emphasised that this had helped them to win. Having held the Highland Charge, the Redcoats poured in fire from both flanks. The battle was over in less than an hour. Cumberland gave full credit for the victory to the courage of his men and the effectiveness of his new bayonet drill. There are some today, however, who remain less convinced. The bayonet drill that was introduced by Cumberland, in my opinion, was totally unsuccessful. The, the practicality of the whole thing was really ridiculous. Now, in a modern European war, both armies would face up towards another. One army would march towards, they would exchange fire, and perhaps one side would give, the other army would then pursue them off the field. And that was a standard European sort of tactic. The Highland clans didn't fight like that. They were individuals. They would charge forward in a solid mass. They would then break up and fight as individual characters. Now, the idea of the bayonet drill was that each man went for the man on the right-hand side. Now, that's fine, providing they all come at the same way. But these men came in different parts and, and broken intervals, and therefore it wasn't a solid line. Common sense tells me that a front rank man with a dirty great broadsword, okay, and you think that this guy sort of striking across him with a bayonet's going to stop him. Yeah, by this time he's got his sword through the head of the guy in front of him. I mean, you know, I don't think it's really going to stop one of these guys. I certainly wouldn't have liked to have tried it. <laughs> 
Even if the effectiveness of Cumberland's plan remains controversial, one truth was established beyond doubt. The bayonet's power lay as much in the minds of those using it as in any drill. Whether the Cumberland drill worked or not, in some sense it doesn't matter whether it worked in a technical sense. The important point was it gave the soldiers confidence. It gave them enough confidence to stand. It gave them confidence in the bayonet as a weapon. And this is terribly important because it's the confidence which they gained with the bayonet there gave them pause to think and to move on from there, to think, right, we've got a weapon which works defensively. Let's see if we can use it offensively. The bayonet had proved itself as formidable in defence as the Highlanders had in attack. It was left to one particular British general to come up with an extraordinary idea. Why not combine the two? the aggression of the Highland Charge and the discipline of a line of bayonets. Somebody present at Culloden was a bit of a genius, and that man was James Wolfe. He saw the offensive capacity of the Highlanders and a little light went on for him. He thought, if we could recruit these guys, they would make terrific fighters. If you combined the bayonet with the Highland Charge, you got a pretty good weapon for colonial wars. The ironic thing is that the bayonet, which was first really being used against Highland Charges, was combined with the ferocity and the offensive capacity of Highland regiments to provide one of the main weapons of the British Army in the later part of the 18th century. This was the General Wolfe, whose famous victory at Quebec secured Canada as a British colony. Thanks to him, the bayonet, particularly in the hands of Highland regiments, became the linchpin of British Army tactics, the weapon of first choice in the expanding empire. The real impetus came from the colonies, in particular in India, where the British forces were almost invariably vastly outnumbered by the Indian armies. And they found that the only way which they could survive, let alone win a battle, was by acting very aggressively indeed. The British Army gradually developed its quite unique technique of advancing towards the enemy at a fairly rapid speed, halting, firing a single volley, and then lowering the bayonet and charging through the smoke. And by the time the Napoleonic Wars, it was a fairly well-honed technique. But it was left to one particular British general to really exploit the power of the bayonet. Of all his colonial victories, the most spectacular was at Assay in 1803, when he drove off a 60,000-strong Indian army with just 5,000 men and, legend has it, was back before breakfast. He was Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. In 1808, he took charge of the British Army in the Spanish Peninsula. It was a fateful appointment. When Wellington took over the British Army in the Peninsula, he brought with him several years of experience in India, where he'd learned to go at the enemy. There was no question of standing there, churning out volley after volley in the hope that he could chew up enough of the French. It was one volley and then charging through the smoke with the bayonet, hit them while they're still dazed, and literally kick them off the premises. Paradoxically, the bayonet is a weapon which is most effective when it's not actually used physically. The idea of the bayonet is to intimidate the enemy, to make him run away from you. Wellington essentially was trying to drive the French away rather than actually kill the French. The wars against the armies of Napoleon gave the British army their greatest victories. These were the years of triumph and swagger for the Red Corps. A line of men with fixed bayonets came to represent the perfect marriage of regimental precision and personal courage. End of the 18th century had seen some quite shameful reverses, certainly the loss of the American colonies. And then suddenly, at the beginning of the 19th century, we have this wonderful string of victories and British confidence is restored. There is the enemy. Face him, front him, and kill him. It needs to be fast work. But if we're slow, he'll come on us. So keep going forward. They have leave to fire on sight. So get them bayonets in. Sharp, in that sense, does reflect the general run of Peninsular officers. I and mean, if you read the memoirs of the, of the Peninsular officers, they're very fond of saying, you know, we, we use the bayonet. You look at this thing from the French point of view. The French are very noisy as they attack. The, the British are waiting very, very quietly, and they're waiting in a long, long line. And the French are getting more and more excited, the drums are going, the guys are cheering. And as you got closer, the redcoats still didn't make a sound. They still didn't move. And this is beginning to worry them. I mean, it really did. We know that. They put it in their letters, they put it in their diary. They didn't like that stillness. And they go up the hill, they're getting closer and closer and closer, and still that damn volley doesn't come. But they know when it does come, it is going to be very, very nasty indeed. And of course it is. 
like it's five or six hundred musket balls converging on the front of, of, of the column. Um, I mean, suddenly what is a, a disciplined, organized column is turned into chaos. I mean, with the, with the front and the sides full of dead and dying men, the people behind trying to step over them, they're losing the cohesion. Uh, still the drums are going, still the officers, those who survived, are pushing them forward. Now what they see in front of them, of course, is a great rill of smoke, I mean, a dense, dense, foul-smelling smoke. Out of this smoke will come five or six hundred guys with, with 17-inch blades on the end of their muskets. And at that point, it's bye-bye. I mean, it's turn round and run. I mean, it's sauve qui peur. Or the usual French battle cry, we are betrayed, as the Imperial Guard fled across the valley of Waterloo. And it happened again and again. And, and you almost get to the point where you begin to think these people must be mad to, to go on doing this. Uh, I mean, even Wellington at Waterloo seemed disappointed, as he said, that they came on in the same old way and we saw them off in the same old way. And, of course, the second great use of the bayonet is to see off horsemen. I mean, this is when we get to the squares against cavalry. And it's at that point that I would say that the, the bayonet is a decisive moment. A war winner, if Ney had broken the British squares, Napoleon would have won Waterloo. Now, agreed, it is the musket fire that keeps the French from the squares, but also what is keeping the French out is just these bristling bayonets. There is still no horse in the world that will charge through a line of bayonets. Horses simply are not that uh, masochistic. By the end of the 19th century, British cold steel had become the stuff of imperial myth. This is one of the most famous paintings to depict the bayonet, the thin red line painted by Robert Gibb in 1881. It depicts an episode in 1854, the Battle of Balaclava, where the 93rd Highlanders, descendants of the men who'd fought at Culloden, brought down a charge by Russian cavalry. So, an image of the bayonet, but also an image that in some way is misleading. It's really the rifles that are decisive, the rifles whose flashes one can see in the background. That was what stopped the Russians, stopped them at about 600 yards. So, in fact, stopped them without any chance of physical contact between the two sides. But interestingly, by emphasising the bayonet rather than the rifle, one goes right back to the idea of personal strength, personal commitment, personal valour, the quality of heroism and character within the British. And this is fundamentally a painting about character. But it is, as I've said, a misleading painting. It's misleading because it gives us no sense of the way in which battles by this period were being fought. Relatively few people died through bayonet wounds. Most people died as a result of rifle power. So, what this does is show us a world that is passing. And it's very interesting that if you look to the future, we are next to see, in terms of image, images that are still alive for us today, we are next to see the image of the bayonet in the First World War. Soldiers advancing slowly, carrying their rifles forward, the bayonets, the classical sun glinting on the steel of the bayonets as they move forward. And, of course, they are machine-gunned to pieces. The horrors of the Somme destroyed the myth of the irresistible thin red line once and for all. As a weapon of the massed ranks, the bayonet was useless, but still it refused to become obsolete. Even though the bayonet's use on the battlefield is obviously limited and becoming ever more limited with the advance of time, it still has a very important function in training, for training a soldier to be aggressive with this sharp bit of steel. When a soldier comes to bayonet training, that is when he starts to learn about aggression. And aggression is very much part of an infantry soldier's makeup because he's called on to do jobs and the bayonet comes into it a lot of times. When it comes to bayonet training, he'll hate it, but he'll hate the enemy. And what's the, that's the sort of personality we want to build up. He'll hate it, but he'll hate the enemy. Even in peacetime, bayonet training refused to die, as thousands of ex-national servicemen remember all too clearly. There would be uh, three or four dummies stuffed with straw hanging from a wooden frame, and you were taught that you made the initial thrust with your bayonet when you ran towards the enemy into the stomach or the groin area. And you then placed your foot onto the fallen enemy and then dispatched him with another thrust of your bayonet, then moved on to do the same to the next one. This is the theory. To this day, nothing has changed. It's just like a surge of electricity, and it gives you uh, more power, and you know you feel stronger. Ah! 
to get you hyped up so that um, your aggression is built up. And once you start that charge towards an enemy, you're not going to have second thoughts about sticking the bayonet in somebody. No matter who stood in front of you, if he's the enemy, then he's going to take it. End of story, basically. Ah! Wait a for ah! Stop them! Ah! It's frightening, isn't it? And it, once again, it's been proved and tried and tested in all theatres of war, and it works. Get your ass down, get your ass down. It's the nearest thing that you get to what you might call battle inoculation. And it wasn't unknown for our staff to get from the local butchers, you know, the gizzards and innards of animals that the butchers are selling, and to put them in plastic bags in these dummies, just to get a feel of, you know, as near as possible to the real thing. The real thing happened in 1982, when Argentina invaded the Falklands. On the night of June the 13th, Robert Lawrence and his platoon fixed bayonets to attack an enemy stronghold high on Mount Tumbledown. That was the first time that you could expect to start looking at the use of bayonets for real. And it was only eventually when I led my platoon on a right flanking attack against some machine gun posts at the end of Tumbledown that we really took on the classic uh, bayonet charge of the movies, as it were. Obviously, this is happening with a great deal of ammunition being used as well, so the bayonet at that point is more a symbol of your intention than it is something you're actually using. They were, of course, used. They were used when we closed with the enemy um, and, in fact, proved themselves to be invaluable pieces of equipment. By the time you use it, you've been firing at each other with modern weapons, often under artillery fire. Grenades are being used, anti-tank rockets are being used, machine guns. So by the time you close with the enemy, the blood lust is certainly up. Uh, and the use of the bayonet, you know, this isn't a, a precise business at that point of a war. Um, you just use it and you kill him any way you can. Even in an era of smart bombs and guided missiles, the bayonet remains an essential part of the soldier's kit. This is the SA-80, standard issue weapon of the British Army. This is a bayonet which comes with the weapon. It's designed so when thrust point first into an enemy, it will part the ribs without sticking in the bone. At the rear, this little lug holds the bayonet onto the weapon and that will stop it falling off if you come under a contact situation. Onto the scabbard. It's a multi-purpose scabbard. A couple of things it's got on it. Firstly, it's got a multi-purpose saw. At the front name, it's got this little lug, which is for bottle opening. To be honest with you, I've never ever, ever opened a bottle with this, and it, as they're not issued in the battlefield, it's, uh, it's a bit dubious why it's there. This little lug here fits in conjunction with the bayonet to produce a wire cutter. It's a very handy tool, this. It's fitted to the side then, in a position there where the soldier can get at it and use it whenever he's required. There will always be a future for the bayonet in that it is the weapon which carries you forward. You can shoot until the cows come home. But at the end of the day, you win the battle by taking the fight to the enemy's ground and standing on his ground. You may need the bayonet to do it. As long as we do have wars and we need a show of strength, bayonets are an important part of that. Even in parades, when they are parading with fixed bayonets on, it's a sight which makes you think twice. And especially if you have been in wars and you realize what it's there for. It's not just ceremonial, it's glistening there for some particular reason. And I think that um, as long as you need infantry, you're probably going to need the bayonet. Anyone that's ever taken part in close quarter combat where you're fighting hand to hand with bayonets, I think that can only ever just stay with people who've done it because by its nature alone it means that you are within feet of this man you can hear him you can see him you can smell him and ultimately with a bayonet you're only ever killing him at a maximum of three feet let's say uh, with a small arms a pistol whatever yes they are close quarter weapons but there is a detachment you must also remember that when you stab someone with a bayonet you are holding onto one end of something that's stuck into him at the other. You are actually physically joined at that point. <laughs>
you're not standing 10 feet away and emptying a magazine from a pistol into him. So it's a very memorable, um, difficult event, which is the true nature of warfare, much, much different to uh, pressing a button that releases bombs. Of all the weapons in the whole history of warfare, none in its time was so hated, feared and despised by its enemies as the English longbow. The English longbow was the decisive weapon of the Middle Ages. Nothing could rival it for range, accuracy and devastating power. The immense power of this thing was really, really surprising. There were cases where longbows would literally shoot through trees. Uh, they were capable of penetrating armor, even the thickest plate armor, at short ranges and mail almost all the time. There was nothing quaint about the English longbow. In the hands of a trained archer, it was a killing machine. The English archer, with a good bow in his hand, could kill a French man-at-arms at 100 yards or more every time. That's how good this thing is. It was on a muddy field in northern France in 1415 that the longbow won its greatest victory. Here at Agincourt, 5,000 English archers defeated a French army five times its size, and an English myth was born. But we in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few. We... Band of brothers! But behind the rhetoric lies the reality. A ruthless and bloody battle won by a lethal weapon. The longbow. The longbow was made from the simplest of materials. Its unique characteristics come from nothing more complex than the wood of a yew tree. The English longbow at its best was made from continental yew. It was made from one piece, a self-stave of yew, which was kept to the best quality possible, and it comprised of the heartwood of the yew and the sapwood of the yew. Now, the sapwood of the yew is an excellent resistor of tension, while the heartwood is an excellent resistor of compression. So in one piece of wood, you've got a natural spring. Well, this is a bow stave before the process of bow making has started. It's a seven foot stave of yew wood. There's the uh, pale, creamy sapwood on the back, the part away from the archer, the outside of the bend, and there's the brown heartwood inside. The transformation of wood into finished weapon is a precise art, developed over centuries. The stave is shaped and honed to give it power and suppleness. When the bow is finished, it is tested for strength and balance on a device called a tiller. The wood has come alive. 
the whole thing describes the perfect arc of a circle. So this thing had both flexibility and great power. And that's really why it was so lethal, not because it was long, but because of what it was made of. Although the bowmaker's art survived through the ages, no one really knew for sure just how powerful the medieval longbow really was, until 1982. Divers exploring the wreck of the Tudor warship, the Mary Rose, made an extraordinary discovery. 138 longbows perfectly preserved. For the first time, historians could get their hands on the real thing. They were astonished to discover that the power or draw weight of a genuine longbow was nearly twice what anyone had thought. You have to have bows within the strength range of these. The strength, the draw weight is measured by what you're holding apart at the length of the arrow. That is what the weight of a bow is. These bows range from perhaps a little bit less than 100 pounds at the very weakest, of which there aren't many, right up to the very top at 170, 180 pounds here, uh, which a lot of people say can't be drawn, but they can. These enormous draw weights had one purpose, to penetrate the armour of the medieval knight. From the early 14th century, armour was developing rapidly. Chainmail had given uh, way to plate armour, which by the time of Agincourt covered virtually all of the body. Uh, a well-dressed knight at Agincourt, one of the gentry class, would have worn uh, plate armour that covered his legs, his arms, uh, probably a solid breastplate. Uh, his head would have been protected by a large helmet called a bassinet to deflect the blows of both swords and arrows. We have descriptions from Agincourt that the archers' arrows pierced the, the, the visors of the French helmets and the sides of their helmets, which were less heavily armoured. So it does have a penetrative power that is uh, formidable. The longbow may have been simple in concept, but it demanded strength and years of rigorous training to use effectively. You'd have to start from a very young age to learn to shoot the larger bows and progress and progress. Also, you'd have to practice on a daily basis to be really good with the longbow. The prowess of the English archer was feared throughout Europe. This was no accident. For over a century before Agincourt, English kings had made practicing the longbow compulsory for men of fighting age. There were rigorous rules to make eligible young men practice the bow for war. Near most large churches in any decent-sized village, there were butts where they were compelled to shoot at least once a week and probably every night. Now, this Sunday practice was uh, so rigorously applied that uh, it made illegal other sports such as uh, Kambach, whatever that may be, volleyball, football, football, the great national game, the great national disease was forbidden. All these other games. Um, were stopped so that, and you were fined for being found at them so that you would practice the bow. The result was a corps of highly trained civilian fighters drawn largely from the middle or yeoman class. Neither aristocratic knight nor lowly peasant, they were a new presence on the medieval battlefield. The majority of archers, I think, would have been quite young men. The pages who served at battles as sort of servants perhaps were around 12 to 14. Some of the archers then, I think, would have been no older than about 16, 17, um, perhaps uh, ranging up to their mid-20s. Most of them, I think, would have been unmarried. Some of them would have been farmers. We know husbandmen, labourers, perhaps the yeomen in the, the classic rich peasant sense. Others would have been townsmen, some with crafts. We know that some of them were butchers, tailors, carpenters, bakers, that kind of thing. Because these yeomen represented a very distinctive social class of kind of the precursors of what might even be called the middle class, they were not people necessarily to be taken lightly. And they knew it. Cocksure and insolent, they have left us with an enduring legacy. The English have a strange gesture that dates back to the days of Agincourt, where they stick two fingers up in the air as a gesture of defiance. If the French caught an English archer, they'd cut the two fingers off 
on both right and left hand, thus stopping him from drawing the longbow again. It was to these men, along with a smaller number of aristocratic knights or men-at-arms, that Henry V turned as he prepared to fight the French. Having inherited his throne from a usurper king, Henry needed a good war abroad to tighten his grip on power back home. When Henry became king in 1413, of course he was still quite young, he was only 26, and he wanted to prove himself in war, but I think also he wanted to uh, improve the lot of his dynasty. He wanted to prove himself against the ancient enemy, the French. Henry and his army set sail from Southampton on August the 11th, 1415. His force was made up of 8,000 archers and 2,000 knights. Like the D-Day invaders more than 500 years later, they headed for the Normandy coast. The plan was to take Harfleur and then head for Paris. But things went wrong right from the start. Harfleur held out far longer than expected and the English started dying of disease. At the siege of Harfleur, many men, of course, took ill. They, they suffered from dysentery, there were problems with the water supply. It's said, too, in the sources that they ate fruit from the trees, which, which caused them to have uh, pretty awful diarrhoea. Uh, it seems, too, that, that bodies were left to rot, and that also was seen as a cause of disease. Harfleur finally fell in September, too late for Henry to advance on Paris. But he refused to retreat. Against the wisdom of his advisers, he decided to taunt the French by marching to Calais, some 250 miles away to the north. This was a show of bravado. But when he reached the River Somme, his plan ran into trouble. A French army was lying in wait on the northern bank. If the English were to reach Calais, they would have to try to outflank the enemy. The English army felt its way along the southern bank of the river, looking for a safe crossing. The French shadowed them on the other side, matching their every move. The English were soon out of rations. The situation was desperate. After seven days of being stalked, the English managed to steal the day's march on the French and finally crossed the Somme. The French were in pursuit. Sensing an easy kill, their army was growing day by day. On October the 21st, nine days after the chase had begun, the French overhauled the English, cutting across their path. By now, the French were five times the size of the English. Their tracks in the mud told a grim tale, as an English eyewitness recorded. We found the roads quite remarkably churned up by the French army, as it had crossed ahead of us, thousands strong. And the rest of us, fearing battle to be imminent, raised our hearts and eyes to heaven, crying out, with voices expressing our inmost thoughts, that God would have pity on us and turn us away from the violence of the French. Three days later, the French blocked the road to Calais. Battle was now inevitable. That evening, the two armies bedded down with only a field separating them. This field was soon to be known as Agincourt, and the battle that was fought there was to be the greatest test for the English longbow. As dawn broke on the 25th of October, the English must have felt themselves to have been in a desperate position, and they were hugely outnumbered, perhaps as much as five to one. Their path to safety at Calais had been barred by a major French army, and they were in a position of near starvation. We know that the English prayed before the battle, and each archer took in his mouth a piece of earth to symbolise dust to dust, and I imagine that many of them thought that they would not live to see the next day. As dawn broke, the English took up their position on the battlefield. The 1,000 men-at-arms were drawn up in three groups, with Henry at the centre. The 5,000 archers were placed in two groups at the flanks, some may have been positioned alongside the men-at-arms. To strengthen their position, they used a simple but effective means of defence. The king had ordered the archers to cut stakes about six feet long, and these were hammered into the ground in front of them, and the archers would fire from behind these, so they acted as a form of defence, and particularly they made it very difficult for the French horses to penetrate close enough to the archers. The French were divided into three colossal groups, the first battalion alone is thought to have consisted of 18,000 knights on foot. On the wings were the French cavalry. So confident were they of victory that the French pushed their own archers so far back to the rear that they played no part in the coming battle. Well, I'm here 
approximately where the French army took position the day of the Battle of Agincourt. The French captains understood perfectly the danger of longbow and of English archers. So uh, they had a plan to uh, fight against the English army uh, and this plan was to attack the wings and the flanks of this English army. It's a great mistake, I think, to see the French as militarily inept. They certainly weren't. They knew from experience the power of the English longbow. And their tactical thinking, their preparation to try and defeat Henry's army, is shown in the Somme plan. Now, this was a plan for battle drawn up prior to the Battle of Agincourt. The Somme plan, which has only recently been rediscovered, proves that the French did have a strategy to defeat the English longbow. A twin-pronged cavalry charge, sweeping wide on both flanks, would encircle the archers and crush them. But for the plan to work, the French knights needed plenty of room for manoeuvre. But on this battlefield, there was a great problem. This battlefield is very narrow. It is 600, maybe 700 metres wide. It's too narrow to have great tactical possibilities. The Somme plan had another problem. It depended on a manageable number of knights, but the French army was now so swollen that there were too many men on the field. Far from guaranteeing victory, the numerical superiority of the French worked against them. If this plan had been followed by the vanguard that was the, the French uh, advance force, only numbering about 6,000 men, but far more flexible than the huge numbers that in fact take, take part in the Battle of Agincourt, the French might well have won. That tall clump of trees marks the very centre of the battlefield. How do we know that? Because that's where upwards of 6,000 French were buried after the battle in three trenches. From this position, seeing that the French were doing nothing but uh, furling their banners and sitting down to breakfast, roughly where you see that thin line of trees further behind the big clump. So Henry V had his army move slowly forward in three separate moves so as to keep alignment, to keep discipline, until they were perhaps 200 yards short of that clump of trees, where at extreme range the English archers opened up and thus started the Battle of Agincourt. could expect to engage the enemy at up to 330 yards. This would give me a tremendous advantage. They couldn't get nowhere near me, and I'd be able to shoot more at them and kill more of them until they came too close for comfort. The archers were proving to be highly effective. Rather than sweeping wide to encircle the English, the cavalry were funneled towards the centre of the battlefield. As these armoured knights approached the killing zone at high velocity, they found themselves in a lethal environment. Not only could their armour be penetrated by these long shafts, but their horses were being shot down with great rapidity causing them to basically fly off their horses. Now, the point of this is that the, the armored knight needed to be at point-blank range to affect his casualties, but he was still literally hundreds of yards away from these yeomen. So he was es essentially helpless in this environment. The uh, cavalry charge of the French on either side was a, came in very depleted form, and by the time it got anywhere near our lines, it had, in fact, been shot to pieces hundreds, thousands of arrows hurling at them, so thick that it darkened the sky, so heavy that it seemed like hail, said contemporary eyewitnesses. And the horses were turned back in complete disarray, wounded, out of control, into the front line of the then advancing French Central Infantry. Some 18,000 seems to me the likely number of the first French battalion that now marched on the English. This was the second phase of the battle, 
The French knights now advanced on foot through the muddy battlefield towards the English. The archers, having seen off the cavalry charge, now had a new set of targets. We're standing in the centre of the battlefield here, on the verge of the killing ground. The French advancing across the ploughed field behind me into an arrow storm delivered by the English bowmen. These great clouds of arrows forced the French knights on foot to bunch inwards. Uh, an almost automatic response to an oncoming cloud of arrows is to shy away. And this constricted what was already a very densely packed body of men on foot. <laughs> And remember all the time they've got riderless horses running in amongst them, knocking them down. So they were stumbling, they were blinded, and really panicking, I think, is very likely. As the French got closer, though, certainly to within 100 or, or, or 60 yards, they found that the English arrows, with their bodkin heads, would pierce even the thickest armour, the visors of their bassinets, and the English were capable of, of pinpointing weak points in the armour, uh, where the limbs joined, essentially. This is the type of arrowhead used at Agincourt for armour penetration. Basically, what you've got are four cutting edges, and the arrowhead is wasted. So, when it strikes the armour, it parts the metal or shears the metal and when it overcomes the thickest part of the metal there's nothing to stop the rest of the arrow sliding right through. Medieval doctors knew only too well the devastation that longbow wounds could inflict on the human body. But modern forensic science gives us an even more accurate picture of its lethal power. If we imagine that this block is the shoulder and it's struck by an object travelling at about 200 feet per second, weighing about 70 grams, once it's penetrated between or through the armour, it's going to strike the skin. It's going to easily break through the skin and get into the muscle and the tissue that's underneath it. In the shoulder, there are some major blood vessels and major nerves. An arrow is just going to cut through those like a knife through butter. If it hits the joints and the bones of the shoulder, it's going to smash those completely. And that's going to render the person immobile, and it's certainly going to immobilise the left arm. It will also probably, because of the force that's been striking them on that shoulder, it will probably spin them around and throw them to the ground at the same point. So the chances are, forensically, that that person will be instantaneously excluded from the battle by pain, by shock, and by simply being thrown to the ground. Once the French men-at-arms are in contact with, with the English men-at-arms, the archer's role changes. They throw down their bows, they pick up their short, heavy swords, known as falchions, great chopping blades, and their mauls, that is to say their lead-tipped mallets they use for driving in the stakes, and go and mix it with the French men-at-arms, many of whom, of course, are bewildered or exhausted and are literally physically knocked down and taken for ransom by the lightly equipped English. For an aristocratic French knight, a close encounter with this new breed of warriors was a horrifying and humiliating experience. They did not approve of being shot at by people they regarded as peasants. That wasn't their idea of warfare at all. It was gentleman against gentleman, honour against honour. And uh, in that chivalric code, you were able to yield to a, a noble opponent. But the idea of yielding to people from the soil, to yeomen from... from uh, the counties of England and Wales, was really more than they could encompass. When the last French knights were forced to yield, the Battle of Agincourt was effectively over. But for the English archers, there was more killing to be done. Afraid that the French were about to mount another charge, Henry ordered that his French prisoners be killed on the spot. The English men-at-arms hesitated, reluctant to break this ultimate code of chivalry. But the archers had no such inhibitions. Henry can't find many men-at-arms who are prepared to do it, and he has to appoint a squire and archers to start the slaughter. At Agincourt, the English archers gave the French an unforgettable lesson in a new kind of war. From the French point of view, the battle was a, a disaster because it showed them to be vulnerable to common 
ordinary men <laughs> carrying the bow and really does undermine the idea that in order to fight you needed to be a chivalrous and well-equipped knight. Prior to this time, the knight had been relatively invulnerable on the battlefield. The longbow changed all this because it put the knight definitely at risk. It was the beginning of the end in many ways for the aristocracy. The longbow revolutionized warfare. You no longer had to fight your enemy man to man. Killing could now take place at a distance. This was the longbow's decisive triumph. But at Agincourt, unnoticed at the time, a new weapon played its part in the battle. On that day, one of the English soldiers died, killed by a gun. That lonely gun which killed that single soldier was at that very point, much like a, kind of a, a new species crawling uh, across, the, uh, across the battlefield, uh, ready to one day inherit the world. <laughs>